So next up, I am so thrilled to welcome the next speaker on stage. We have with us today Scott Cohen, who is the Chief Innovation Officer for Recorded Music at Warner. I had a chance to speak with Scott yesterday, who has quite the impressive story. In the 90s, he built the first digital distribution platform, music platform called The Orchard. Now, this billion dollar business is a part of Sony. He retired from the company earlier this year, and his retirement lasted, wait for it, a full weekend before he was brought on by Warner in London to look into the future of music. Scott himself is a believer of augmented reality, virtual reality, blockchain, and AI. He is also part cyborg, but we will leave that for another discussion. Today, he is here to tackle the ever-persistent question, what is the real value of music? Let's give it up for Scott Cohen. Yeah, that would be good. I thought I was about to be in a TikTok video. I was supposed to dance along to that. Um, so I'm from New York, and I don't scare so easily. But I remember in the late 90s, I was in Huxton Square to see a gig. Anyone been to East London Shortage? Huxton Square, Dalston? Well, let me tell you, I don't know when you were there first, but it was scary shit in the 90s, like abandoned buildings, crime. So I went there, I'm thinking, what the fuck am I doing in this place? I might as well just be back in the Bronx. Um, and this photo was taken, 1998. It's called A Great Day in Huxton. Definitely did it during the day because they couldn't have done that at night. And this photo was kind of an homage to a very famous photo called A Great Day in Harlem where it was a bunch of jazz musicians in the photo. In this case, it's a bunch of musicians and artists and designers and actually a couple of their family members, all based in East London, in Shoreditch, Huxton Square, Dalston. And why were they there? Because it was cheap. It was the only place they could afford to go. So they went there, they start you know, setting up rehearsal spaces and flats of their own, and then a couple of coffee shops open, and then some music venues, and then some more people move in because it's getting kind of cool, and then some restaurants open and more bars and nightlife happens. Before you know it, it's almost hipster. And then you know you've gone over when all the new young tech people start moving in all the developers and engineers start moving in. And then on the backs of that, the VCs move in. And you have what's now called the Silicon Roundabout. So within 20 years, the entire region transformed. In 2017, it was the most expensive tech sector in the world. It cost more than San Francisco and almost double Brooklyn in less than 20 years, and it, and it drives so much value, because it's not just the music, it was what the music triggered and continues to trigger today, because it's there. So I wonder, why don't we value music more? Like, I remember late 90s, early 2000s, there was this issue in the music industry called Piracy, anyone ever hear of it? Napster, Grokster, how many other stirs? Um, and people were stealing music and the music industry is flipping out. Like, are you fucking kidding me? You can't take our music for free. There's a value to it. It's very valuable. So what value did they assign to music? 99 cents. The cost of a pack of chewing gum. Really? That's the value of music? What other industry would do that? 
You guys know Spotify? I mean, Spotify's value isn't, okay, how much money do we make from subscribers? Add to that all the ad revenue we take in. Then we deduct all the money we have to pay to the rights holders and all of our expenses around the offices and all of our marketing. And whatever little number we're left with at the end, that's the value of the company. No way. They're valued over $25 billion dollars. Because they recognize that there's more value than a simple transaction. Like, we devalue music when we say the only value of it is captured in a CD rate or a download rate or a streaming rate. And so how are we going to capture that value? Um, my favorite topic, blockchain. Anyone know anything about blockchain in here? Whoa. Any blockchain experts? Really? Yeah, exactly. He did this. Yeah, it's kind of blockchain experts. There's a few, but not many. So because there's so few, I, I, I'm, I'm not one of them. I'm allowed to talk about it. Um, I, I have a very short time today, so I'm not going to get into really the nitty-gritty of how it works you know, hash functions and distributed ledgers and cryptography. Plus, that's kind of boring shit. Um, but just know it's really important. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is talk about not how it works, but what it can do, all right? So think of it this way. Everyone knows the internet, and the internet... Um, was originally launched to connect governments and universities and the military, and they all used it. And then Tim Berners-Lee launches the World Wide Web in the early 90s that sits on top of the internet. It's a layer on top of the internet, and it's just a series of protocols. So think of protocols as another, another word for a language. So if you speak German, and this one speaks French, and another person speaks Russian, and this one speaks Mandarin, we can't communicate unless we all use a single protocol, a single language. In this case, it's English. We're all going to speak English. So what Tim Berners-Lee did was he launched a series of protocols called the World Wide Web, you know, TCP, IP, HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol. It was just a series of protocols, and what those protocols did was it allowed every website to speak to every other website, and every website to speak to a client, meaning uh, a web browser. You follow me? Yeah? Are you sure? Nod your heads? Yeah, yeah. This is, this is not complex. The way I explain it, it's, as he'll tell you, it's way more complex. But now we have an opportunity to launch a whole new series of protocols called the blockchain. So the first time it was deployed was 10 years ago. Bitcoin, ring a bell? Anyone buy it? Anyone make money? Yeah. Anyone lose money? Yeah. <laughs> also, eh. eh. No, I won't give advice whether to buy it or not. Um, but, but, but you have to think about it. So, how do you, so before Bitcoin, if I wanted to give somebody money online, I couldn't do it directly. Like, here, I have a 20-pound note in my pocket, right? Let's say I want to give it to you. Not that I will give it to you, that I want to give it to you. Um, imagine that I wasn't able to do that. It would seem quite odd, artificial. I mean, you're right in front of me. I see you. I don't know you, but I see you. And it would seem strange if, in order to hand you this, I had to give it to a bank who would then give it to another bank who would then give it to you. But that's how it works online. You can't transfer money directly to anybody. You must go through a third party, a bank, or several banks. And so what Bitcoin said is, couldn't we just create a series of protocols that could verify I'm me and you're you and we could change, exchange value without anyone in between? 
I mean, seems obvious. Why do we need a platform between us to do this transaction? We can have a series of protocols instead. Because for Bitcoin, there's no company called Bitcoin. They don't have offices or staff. They don't file taxes. Nobody owns it. It doesn't exist. Bitcoin is like saying HTTP. Who do you call? Nobody. It's just a protocol. So Bitcoin is a series of protocols that allows people to exchange value online without anyone in between. And it seems obvious, but it's fucking revolutionary. Imagine if I want to take a photo of my food. Yes, that's my food. Uh, it's, a, it's a vegan soup. If anyone would like the recipe, you can see me after uh, in the uh, loft where I'm, where I'm it, hashtag vegan food. But if I take a picture of my food and I want to upload it so that my friends can see it, my family can see it, my coworkers can see it, and honestly, anyone that follows hashtag vegan can see it, why must I deliver it to somebody else's platform? Why must it go on Facebook or Instagram? Because once it hap goes up there, then they take all my data, they serve me up with ads, they manage my, my news feed and tell me what I should see and what I shouldn't see. Fuck that, I just wanted to share a photo with the people that cared. Surely we don't need that business between us. Surely we can have a series of protocols to allow that to happen. And think about every other business where you take all of the content and put it on a single platform, and all of the users are on the same platform, and then, of course, all of your data is on that platform, your likes, your preferences. There's advertising, bless you. There's adver <laughs> Gesundheit, sorry. Um, there oh, what do you say? Salute? What do you say? <laughs> To your love? When you sneeze, you go, to your love? Okay, sorry. Hey, you're the one that interrupted, not me. So, where were we? Uh, why does everything have to be on the same platform? And you can think about all kinds of industries where there's a platform between the content owners and the customers. Will they still exist in the future? I don't want to mention names because anything I say are not the, necessarily the views of the Warner Music Group um, because we have amazing partners in music like Apple and Amazon and Spotify, Deezer, YouTube, Google. We love them all. And VR. VR is absolutely going to change the nature of how music is valued. The problem is, the hardware right now, it's kind of shitty. Anyone use VR in the room? Does anyone own a VR headset? Okay, you know it's a bit heavy, kind of might give you a headache if you wear it too long, you know, because it's also very heavy in the front, which kind of, well, actually, I'm thinking maybe millennials, it won't bother them because they're used to walking around like this all day. Um, but it definitely pulls your head forward and can kind of give you a headache from if you stare at it too long. But the biggest problem is, is actually the content. It's not great. And I may offend some people in VR that are in the room. Anyone work in VR in the room? You do. You're <laughs> OK. I love you. Is that what I'm supposed to say? <laughs> oh, OK, OK, thanks. <laughs> um, it's scott.cohen at warnermusic.com. Um, what was I going to say? Where were we? What are we talking about now? Now, I, Oh, VR. Oh, right. The content is mostly shit. I mean, particularly around music. I mean, some of the other gaming content is pretty good. I remember um, uh, back in the spring, they released the Oculus Quest headset. Does anyone know about the Oculus Quest? So the Oculus Quest is the first fully untethered VR headset. So no wires. It doesn't connect to a computer. Matter of fact, you don't need a computer. It doesn't have anything to do with a computer. It's fully untethered. Um, 
which makes for a great experience. So the first experience I did was I downloaded a boxing game, Creed. You know, anyone you know, know uh, what's his name, Rocky? And then he fought Creed in, I don't know, whatever movie, and then, oh, spoiler, who hasn't seen any of the Rocky films? Mm, he dies. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but then he has a son. <laughs> And he becomes a boxer. It's, a, it's I don't know, it was like in Rocky Eight or something. But in any case, there's this video game. So I put on the headset, and what's really amazing is it's not like, it's not like um, experiencing boxing in VR. I'm not controlling boxing in VR. I'm boxing. Like, my fists are up because there's a fucking guy throwing punches at me, and I'm ducking and I'm diving. My heart is pounding. I'm sweating. I am totally lost in the game. It was an incredible experience. And then I think, what if the boxing industry had made that game? It would have been, see a classic Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali fight. You can be in the center of the ring. You can be in the boxer's corner. You can be in the front row. You can look down on them. Like, just different perspectives. Like, who the fuck wants that? And no offense, but this is about what I see now for the music industry. Watch a concert in VR. Be in the front row. Be on the side of the stage. Do anything but actually participate in the in the event. I mean, I want the V, not the R, virtual reality. I want something unreal, not just to mirror reality. If I want to see a gig, I'll go to see a gig. I don't want to put on a headset for that. So let's think about this. Since Tim Berners-Lee launched the World Wide Web, there's been this long, slow movement where before the web, people read books, newspapers, magazines, watched television, movies, videos, right? Listened to records on the radio, bought CDs and cassettes. We did all of that kind of stuff. But little by little, once the web launched, it wasn't enough. We wanted to contribute. So think about things like social media. First, we just kind of wanted to write a message, a status update. Then we want to take photos and videos. We wanted to comment and share stuff. We, we were happy to receive stuff, but only to the extent we could feed back into the system. We didn't want to just participate. We wanted to contribute. And this whole contributory atmosphere around the user is what's key to all of this. That's what makes that boxing game so fun. I didn't want to watch it. I wanted to be it. I mean, I think about what could be done in music very differently. So imagine an AI-powered instrument like the Artifon, which is a, a company out of Nashville. And, and it's an instrument that you don't have to have any experience in playing an instrument. You can just start playing. And imagine we transform that instrument so that whatever music is playing in the background, let's say I set it up like a guitar, it's a piece of hardware, and I strum something, whatever I strum, the AI could potentially make sure it's in key with whatever music is behind me playing. So I could strum, and it's in key. Now I put on my VR headset, and holy shit, I'm on stage, a stadium full of people, and who am I on stage with? Led fucking Zeppelin. Robert Plant is there next to me, shirt undone, swinging the microphone. Jimmy Page is there jamming out. And I say, no, I got this lead. It's Stairway to Heaven. Listen to it my whole life. Pick this up. And without ever playing a note, I'm on stage playing the lead guitar to Stairway to Heaven. That's a lot more compelling than just watching a gig. So let's go back to this photo in Shoreditch, a great day in Huxton. All of that happened organically with the abandoned buildings and the cheap rent and the artists moving in. 
but does it have to happen organically? Could these things be engineered? Because when you think about the value to a city, a city like Berlin that should be a music city, I mean, it is not just the gig that makes money. I mean, they buy instruments, they have rehearsal spaces, the people that work for them are all kind of entrepreneurs, the person selling merch, the sound engineer in the venue, the producer in the studio. All of this is an ecosystem that then goes even bigger to say, what value does music drive? Because now people go to the gig and they buy tickets and they buy booze and they buy merch. But maybe they took an Uber there. Maybe they went to dinner before the gig. Maybe, like the speaker said earlier, they literally traveled to Berlin because they've heard about the great nightlife. And how much money do they spend in hotels and flights? We're not capturing the real value of music by just monetizing that stream. Everybody else is making money off of our creations, including all the startups that kind of, I don't want to say glom on, but you know, suck on to this music business. And that value isn't being passed back to us in any meaningful way. So my point is this. This doesn't have to happen organically it can actually be engineered. You can go into a city and say, what is your music strategy? And if you don't have one, let's get one. Because it'll drive business for the musicians, but it also drives business for the city. So thank you very much. Uh, would you be willing to do yeah, okay. I'm not done, apparently. <laughs> yes, how can I help you? <laughs> Thank you so much for this amazing and insightful talk. We did actually get a few questions in, um, so if we could pull up the Slido and just I, go I, into I, I specifically didn't leave room for a question, but okay. Okay, because you do have the Q&A at 3.10 at the couple. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do one question? I'll do whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hopefully they're not easy ones. Are major rights holders actually interested in the full transparency technologies like blockchain would provide? 100%. That's the thing. So I can just tell you at Warner Music Group, we're in loads of uh, POCs, proof of concepts, and trials with blockchain companies. Um, there's a, a really important one based here in Berlin called Bitfury, doing Bitfury Surround but there's Verify Media, Active Media, there's a whole bunch of blockchain companies, and we're all in. Okay. I, I'll answer a second one, it's there. Sure, then They see it. it. Uh, what is Warner Music's view on user-centric streaming payouts? Wouldn't this be an obvious first step to a fairer and more comprehensible royalty distribution? I actually don't know Warner's position on this, but a long time ago I used to sit on the BPI Council, which was the British Phonographic Institute, or industry, I don't even know what the I stands for. But it's the rights holders, you know, Sony, Universal, Warner, and I sat on this, this board. And we actually did some, some studies on the user-centric payout. I'm not gonna explain what it is, but whoever asks, I'll explain. Um, and it didn't really change that much. So the top 100 were still the top 100, you know, Taylor Swift, Ed Sheeran, no, nothing really moved. And the positions that moved were like, somebody moved from you know, position nine to 10, but whoever was 10 moved to nine. And it didn't really have any great impact. And this notion, this mythical, the, the reason it came about was because what if somebody only streams one artist, shouldn't they get their whole tenor a month? But we looked at the, 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 the uh, the stats, and we never found that mythical person that only streamed one artist only that whole month. I mean, I understand the argument. I don't think anyone's even against it. I, I think we, we're, I'm guessing we're in kind of a no position right now, but I don't mind. I think it, if, if it makes people happy, we'd happily do it. All right. So thank you so much for that. And for everyone who has more questions to Scott, um, he will be doing an Ask Me Anything session um, upstairs in the couple um, today at 3.10. So thank you so much. Thank and another you. round of applause.